Okay. All right. Right, well, let's start then. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I can see that we've got uh, people from Europe, but also Africa and Latin America, which is good. Uh, also, given the, uh, the fact that we're looking at uh, examples from at least two, two continents. So it's good to have an intercontinental attendance. And um, also thank you all for being here now. Uh, after all, this is probably one of the busiest times of the year, whether on the farm or in the office. And uh, with holiday season approaching the Northern Hemisphere, I mean, not everybody may even be uh, have the thoughts elsewhere. So thank you for, for being here and taking the time. So today, the topic about land from land abandonment to land revival, we've got three speakers who will be giving three different visions on this issue and how they dealt with it. And um, I don't think we shall waste any more time. We get straight, get stuck in. So I pass the floor to the first speaker, uh, that's John Whitelaw and Elena Sobakina, who will talk about the Pichi Mahuida uh, project in Chile, South America. Uh, Elena, unfortunately, is caught in a time zone, which makes it impossible for her to be here. But John is, will take over and um, will do the whole presentation. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. And uh, hopefully the, the screen sharing is going to work. Are we, are we there? OK. This. Um, yeah, this is the story of uh, Elena and John, who in 2005 saw a place in Patagonia that was suffering and we thought deserved a better life. It doesn't pretend to be an account of best practice. It's, um, but hopefully it, it will show you what can be done with uh, a little bit of personal commitment. So where are we? We're... Um, in the southern part of Chile, about 1,500 kilometers south of uh, Santiago. And we're in uh, the region which is Region Aysén, or Region 11. If you look at the, um, the, the Google Earth or, or a map, you'll see there's a, a big lake down there. It's um, the second biggest lake in Latin America, Lago Ganarao Carrera. And we are 10 kilometers from that, right up against the, what is the Northern Patagonian ice shelf. Um, we're also adjacent to the Lagos Laguna San Rafael uh, National Park, which is a man and biosphere reserve. Now that um, could be good news, but it's, as you'll hear later, it's, it's a mixed, mixed blessing. This region, uh, Patagonia, is, is advertised for, um, for tourism as being uh, pristine, uh, come and see the, the glaciers, the untouched wilderness, and the raging rivers, and, and all that sort of stuff. But in actual fact, although there are places like that, most of the region is heavily degraded by activity that started in the mid 20th century and continues today. The history of the valley that we're in is more or less the same as the history of the, the whole region. Um, up, the first settlement was um, European settlement was early 20th century, and it was mainly extensive um, sheep stations. But then in the mid 20th century, there was a program of active colonization. The, the government uh, became nervous about the, um, uh, the links of the region to Argentina, and uh, it started a program to, uh, to colonize the area. And the way it did it was um, basically it, it gave land to settlers who, who cleared the forest. Now, the clearing of the forest was, was on occasions prescribed burning. On other occasions, it was just the easiest way of, of, of getting rid of the forest. But the consequence was, was predictable. Without, without the forest to protect the soil in that sort of climate with uh, severe uh, extremes of temperature, the soil baked in summer and froze in winter and the wind and rain and, and ice just got rid of it. 
The cattle and sheep quickly ate anything which um, tried to regrow. And the resulting erosion and soil loss are evident. They're, they're bare rocks covered with dead um, tree trunks and wide meandering streams that are, are clogged with sediment. And now the invasive species are, um, uh, are encroaching as, as well. Sadly, um, there is very little ecological memory. And you see here, you know, the size of some of the trunks that, um, uh, of the trees. The, the, the photo on the top left, the top right, is of a, um, a dead uh, koiwe tree, which was, was burnt. It's sitting on top of a rock, which is about two meters above the, um, uh, the surrounding soil. And so you can see that, that at least two meters, if not three meters of soil has been lost here. And that's, that's what we're facing. We know a lot about what happened at the time because a Swiss geologist passed through with an expedition very soon after the fires went through. And Elena was fortunate enough to, to find his journals and, and diaries in the university in Zurich. And these two photos are from his, his um, uh, expedition. The photo on the left is um, uh, of property just next to ours. And the photo on the right is, is probably in, in, in our property. But the, there was no gradual change of, of land use. It was a, a very abrupt, abrupt catastrophic and, and basically irreversible um, um, uh, step. So the change in, in land use happened um, at the end of 2005 when we bought the properties. I have to admit it, it was not a carefully thought out measure. It was more an act of the heart rather than the head, but it was a, a sense of responsibility that, that we just felt we couldn't, couldn't refuse. We retired. Um, Elena is an international lawyer, and while I started my career as an agricultural scientist, I morphed into being an international environmental bureaucrat along the way. Both of us have worked with international environment programs, and we have a fair understanding of these issues. But we decided to stay private and independent. And so the project is, is family owned, which makes it personal. It's not possible to restore the ecosystem. You, know, you saw the, um, the extent of the soil loss, too much has been destroyed. But our aim is to rehabilitate as much of the natural ecosystem as we can and to prevent total ecological amnesia. The first step was to remove the anthropogenic stress, which is just a polite way of saying, we took all the cows and sheep away. And then because there was no infrastructure there at all, we had to build somewhere to live. We had to build road for access, the energy systems and that sort of stuff. And then we focused on stabilizing areas that were actively eroding, protecting those that were vulnerable and, and restoring the, the wetlands. In the process, um, quite by accident, we've become the biggest private project of native forest restoration in the region and possibly in, in Chile. More than 230,000 trees um, have been planted. And I'm not sure whether that sounds like a lot of trees to you or, or not, but it, it is or has been a bit of a challenge. The first challenge was really to, to work out how to plant the trees because the, there was no successful experience with, with large scale native tree forestation, reforestation. And so with the help of a, a forestry engineer, we, um, we developed a protocol for, for planting, which comes as close as we can to emulating the dynamics of a natural forest. And we've been very successful. We've got on all our plantings, more than 85% survival rate and on some plantings, uh, more than 90%. All the planting is done by hand. 
has been done by hand. We, we've had to um, uh, buy the seedlings from about 400 kilometers north. We bring them down and then we load them 400 at a time on the horseback and ship, transport them up the mountains to where we're planting. These trips take between three and five hours, you know, round trip. So it's, you can see that it's a, it's a labor and time intensive um, uh, pastime. When we plant, we don't, we don't um, give the, 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 the trees any um, uh, help really. We, we don't give them uh, special watering. We don't um, provide them with, with um, fertilizer. What we do do is we, we take care how we plant them and the way we plant them and, and where we plant them. Unfortunately, um, the source of trees has, um, has disappeared. It wasn't commercially viable for the company to continue to um, produce um, native seedlings. And so we've, we've had to embark on our own um, uh, program of harvesting seed and growing our own seedlings. It's not been easy. It's a, it's a lot of work and COVID landed right in the middle of, um, of it. And so we've had um, mixed success. With some, some varieties, we've done well. With other varieties, we've done a lot less well. And the photo is at the, um, uh, the bottom left is of um, one of our workers, um, Fernando, um, planting. And you can see that he's planting around a bush to provide um, uh, wind cover or protection from the wind. And on the right um, is uh, Lewis Moraga, the forestry engineer with whom we work. And these two trees that he's um, holding there quite proudly, and now they were part of the planting in 2016. So they've, they've done, done really well. And I seem to have there we go. We'll go back. Um, we've been also quite successful in, in stabilizing um, uh, and reducing soil loss in many areas. The, the approach, the general approach of, of um, trying to expand areas of where that we still have some tree tree cover um, and putting in physical barriers where where it, it's been necessary has has cut down the um, uh, the active erosion quite considerably and another feature is that, that without the grazing animals the, the the natural regrowth has been outstanding um, Nature, if it's if it's allowed to to help itself, really does recover quite quickly. The wetlands have been a a, a real success. I'm I'm really really happy with those. Um, without having animals in there grazing in the in the summer and by blocking the drains that, that have been put in. Those the wetlands have rebounded. We've now got migratory birds coming through. We've got fish. We've got amphibians, and uh, the areas of smegma and moss have, um, have have increased, and they're looking looking really healthy. And there, the photo on the bottom left there is a a, a piche. He, he's a a very shy little armadillo sort of um, creature. And uh, they've come back as well. And the photo on the right is of, of one of the wetlands in the um, in the higher areas of the of, of the property. We, even though we 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 think we're being reasonably successful, I think it's important that um, we not forget what was there previously. And, and so we've put in some reminders um, uh, for, for tourists who, who pass through. You know, as I mentioned, we're adjacent to the, 
Laguna San Rafael National Park. We have to, by law, provide access, an access route through our place for, for tourists. And so we've put in a couple of things. The, the um, signboard on the, on the left says, in memory of the ancient forest that once covered this valley and was deliberately burnt in 1939, and of all its plant and animal life and the millions of tons of soil that were lost forever. And that message is there in, in nine languages. So we've, we've captured a fair, um, a fair range of the, um, uh, the potential tourists. And the photo on the right is, uh, the, um, is entitled, The Tree No Longer Here. And the, uh, the idea for that came from um, some of the locations in France where where there have been fatalities um, in various places, the, um, the local authorities has erected um, silhouettes, metal silhouettes, to remind people that that you know someone died here, and that's that's the that's the message. Because it's a personal project, um, our indicators of, of performance. Um, uh, and effectiveness are, are very personal. And one of the indicators we use is um, that nature is back and is not afraid. And a good indicator of that is, is the puma. We're in, in the, um, a valley called Valley Leonis, Leonis, and the puma, but um, the settlers were very successful in, in killing them. And now, in the in the daytime, we've 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 got pumas. So that's that's a um, uh, grass. It's, we're very happy with that. Another one is is when I walk around the trails um, and I see the trees that we've the seedlings that we planted, and they're doing well. They're looking healthy, and you can I can almost hear them saying, "You know, look at me, look at me. I'm, I'm doing really well." And and thank you. And you know, it sounds silly, I know, but, but that's a, yeah, it's a very personal thing. And another thing we're very happy with is that we've managed to stay off social media. You know, a zero registration on social media for us is, is a major success. We're not without challenges. Um, probably the, the major challenge is keeping the neighbor's cows out. Um, it's sort of ironic that um, a combination of being next to the park and neighbors has meant that we've had to install kilometers of fencing to, to keep, keep cows out. And it's, it's important because the cows are the major vector for invasive species such as, as Rosa mosqueta. And you can see in the bottom right, the photo there, the cows swum across the river from the national park on the other side of the river and is, is trying to get through the fence. Um, and, and they succeed. This, this is a 5,000 volt electric fence, but they are determined and they get through. So it's a constant battle um, uh, keeping them out. The being next to the national park, as I said, should be good news, but it's not. The, the management is not anywhere near what is, is required of a, um, uh, a national park, let alone for what is a UNESCO Man in the Biosphere Reserve Area. There is zero presence by the authorities to monitor tourism, or to keep cows out of, out of the area or other livestock out of the area. And so um, that, is, that is a bit of a challenge. And I think probably the way that we have to do, deal with that is by trying to work more directly with, with UNESCO on, on, on what, what should be done. Um, the most challenging though is, is the long-term protection of the project. Um, I'd like to think that we're both immortal, but, but that 
probably is is not the case. Um, and so we need to think about how the, the project will be protected in the future. And Elena is the person that um, uh, is working through this. We're working on um, legal arrangements for the protected land as, uh, as the main protected um, measure. She has the necessary competence and by doing it correctly, um, if we get the legal status correct, then that reduces the, the need for, um, or the, the importance of uh, future financial um, security. The arrangements um, include, it's not exclusive, giving priority to nature's rights in all the actions, the restoration of the observance of the status of the biosphere reserve in the neighboring um, park, and that's important because if we were to think of bequeathing the land to the park and having it incorporated into the park, then we would want to make sure that it, it's, it's protected and, and managed properly. We've concluded agreements on the um, Derecho Real, the real right to conservation in accordance with um, the national law. And that means that the, the the conservation aspects are actually now tied with, to the land title. And, and so it's, and it is, uh, we've done it in a way that's a little bit different from what is, is happening in, in Chile in, in that the, we've assigned the rights to individuals and not to companies. And um, it, it is possible to do, and, and that's, that's the way we've, we've, we've done it. Um, in this region, the uh, tourism laws are, are enforced virtually, well, they're virtually not enforced at all. And so um, uh, we've got to look at a way of, of dealing with that, that issue because tourism is the major destructive force after agriculture. In looking at, at legal things, it's better for us to look to Europe and, and civil or statutory or continental law rather than North America, which is, is common law. Um, the Chilean law is, is a, the national legislation is typical um, uh, civil law legislation. And we can learn, I think, more from the relevant um, uh, European examples than the, um, uh, the North, ex North American experience. So that's, that's where we are. Um, I guess what I'd like you to take away from this is that um, for long-term um, uh, viability of, of projects, there is a need for a sound legal basis that, Private and personal allows for flexibility and, and independence. It, at times it feels very lonely, but, but the other side of it is that, that decision-making is a lot easier um, and it's possible to, to follow one's instincts. And if it feels right in your situation, do it. Don't just rely on, sit back and rely on peer assessment. A couple of contacts um, and we'd welcome any inquiries for anything legal, then um, Elena's the, the person to contact. For um, anything else on, on the way we've done things in, in terms of planting or, or that sort of stuff, my contact number is, is there. So um, with that, um, I'll hand back to you, Anton. Okay, thank you, uh, John. That was a very eloquent and interesting um, introduction to the challenges and successes of uh, converting former farmland back to nature with a capital N. And it's also an interesting view into private land conservation, something that in Europe is not so well developed, not even as well developed as it seems to be in Chile. Um, although there are um, Euro European projects trying to change that. 
Um, okay, before we go on, just one thing. Um, the um, questions, um, the, of course, at the end of it, we'll do all the questions after the three speakers have had their say. The only question I would allow now is a question where somebody says, I do not understand a word or, or a term, just a question of comprehension. Now, no other questions, we'll do them all at the end. Um, and if you do want to ask a question, uh, please use the hand icon. So raise that uh, the yellow hand, that's uh, that icon. Um, and uh, also there's an option if you want to ask a question anonymously, um, you could um, you can use the chat and then I'll read it out on your behalf. Uh, so you're saying here's a question about such and such. Um, but the idea is that um, on the, that you um, um, raise and use the hand icon and then you can um, unmute yourself and ask your question. You don't have to go uh, uh, turn on your video if you don't want to, but uh, unmuting is enough. It's up to you to whether you want to go uh, unmute, uh, out, um, uh, to, out, to use the video as well when you ask a question. Um, the next speaker, uh, Russ, um, we'll see it's, it's again, it's about um, uh, bringing nature uh, back uh, or into farmland, but the approaches and the philosophy is quite different. Um, uh, Russ, so um, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Anton, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just going to get my screen up. Um, really good to see some familiar faces and names in the audience and um, really fascinating presentation from John. Thank you. Hopefully you can see my presentation now. So um, I work for the Nepa State, which is based in the southeast of England. Um, and the Nepa State has had a very interesting history in creating a rewilding project. And more recently, however, um, setting up a regenerative farm, which is the bit that I manage, uh, and looking at how we can bring nature into our um, actively food producing farmland. So I'll give a little bit of background to the rewilding. Um, where I'm coming from and, and why we're doing what we're doing now and perhaps some lessons to take away from that. So the um, NEP Wildland Project has been going now for nearly 20 years and that started as a result of um, the Burrell family that owned the NEP estate taking the decision to stop actively farming um, what, was, what was grade three land, a very heavy clay in the, in the weald and it became impossible to um, make a profit um, to farm the land successfully in, in, the, in the way that was very much the status quo in the 1990s. And so after, after many years of trying to um, grow arable crops and potatoes, um, they took the decision to stop farming and to, to sell up and, um, the, the business and to settle the debts that had been, that had been accruing. And, and that was really a catalyst for them to think differently around how they should manage this land and how this land actually wanted to be managed, what it naturally wanted to default to. Uh, and they were inspired by a project in the Netherlands uh, where, where they saw how, how na uh, uh, natural processes could help manage land in the way that the land wanted to, to do so. And so after a period of around five years, the um parts of the estate were just left arable crops were harvested and then the land was just left and and what what came was um a resurgence of of different plants and um various types of different fauna that were essentially in the seed bank and and ready to recolonize that land from the hedgerows surrounding or the or the patches of woodland and so nature began to uh, pulse in effect and, and, and um, recover this land. And the owners of the estate uh, were able to do this project with the help of a countryside stewardship scheme, a grant from the government to support um, uh, nature friendly approaches to land management. And that gave them some breathing space to kind of decide what to do. And to cut a long story short, um, there were three large areas of the estate, each about a thousand acres that were ring fenced with an eight foot high uh, ring fence. And all of the internal fencing that, that, that existed where it did was removed. And 
animals were then introduced after about five years of that initial pulse of, of nature. And the reason for that was to try to replicate the post ice age era where there were different grazing herbivores um, involved in, in grazing and creating a dynamism within an ecosystem kind of post ice age in, in this part of the European continent. And the result of that was the um, resurgence even more so of many, many different species, some of which are now facing extinction and some of which are, are very, very rare. For example, I'm talking about the purple emperor butterfly, um, the turtle dove, which is now very close to extinction. And it's and, and what the estate were finding is that the dynamism which the animals brought involved with the recovering um, uh, floral species was, was creating a great space for lots of different natural species to recolonize and now the estate has one of the highest populations of, of many of these rare species. And so the habitat that's been created is, is completely unique in its way, in the, both in the way that it's happened, but in the way that it is now um, operating. But I won't go into too much detail, more detail about that. And I'd certainly recommend um, reading this book, Wilding, which is written by Isabella Tree, the co-owner of the Nepa estate. Um, and that really goes into a lot of detail about why this project happened and what the findings have been so far after 20 years. And it's an absolutely fascinating read. Uh, this book is also being made into a film, um, documentary film, which is going to be available on Netflix and uh, sometime next year. Um, so I really kind of recommend uh, checking that out. And there are also some pretty good talks on YouTube by both Isabella Tree and Charlie Burrell. Um, who, who co-own the estate. So really the, the next phase of what the estate wants to do is, is around the regenerative farm and, and that's where I've been brought in to um, help do that. And for the past 10 years I've been working with farmers uh, all across the UK and Ireland, a little bit in Europe as well, where I've been helping to facilitate farmers conversations and bringing farmers together to talk about how as a community we can actually change the way that we farm and farm our land and manage our animals in a more sustainable and more animal welfare friendly fashion. And that's really about um, changing the way we farm in response to acknowledging our climate impact or the, or the opportunity we have as farmers to um, reduce our climate impact and actually do something positive for the environment and, and the global ecosystem. And so out of that, um, work. We formed an organisation of farmers working together and, and then and furthermore formed a certification mark called Pasture for Life for animals and meat, milk, cheese and other produce that has been reared in a way that is befitting to the environment. And, and we, we formed the UK's only certification mark for 100% grass-fed livestock and that is managed and owned by Pasture-Fed Livestock Association, which is essentially a a grassroots community of farmers right around the UK and Ireland. And it really, really brought to the fore how much say or how much control consumers actually have on, on the way in which we manage our land and, and their buying decisions are so influential as to how farmers act and how farmers, um, what decisions farmers make in, in terms of what they grow and how they how they grow things. So we very much try to balance that um, certification system and, and that pasture for life brand and ethos in, in the sweet spot between what consumers were looking for and prepared to pay for, what worked for farmers, what we could see happening on the ground, and what was also backed up by the science, the observation and understanding of what a different practice um, can do for land restoration and for nature. And out of this really, um, started to emerge the term regenerative agriculture, whereby we were actively observing and seeing the benefit of, of managing our land differently and actually regenerating different aspects of that land. And lots of people ask about what regenerative agriculture actually is. And for me, agriculture really sits on a spectrum uh, and there are different forms right around the world and, and right across Europe and in the UK. And I, and I feel that to the left of this spectrum, um, some agricultural practices are degenerating our land and to the right, uh, they are regenerating. And that might be working towards 
perhaps rewilding or, or some other aspect where something is being improved and rebuilt. And we could argue that sustainable just sits us in the middle and that's just maintaining the status quo. But in today's society, with all the pressures we have and all of the need for urgent action, perhaps we should be going beyond sustainable and actually furthermore improving some of our land and, the, and our practices. And we could look at this um, as, as a sense of direction and where perhaps most farming sits within within global agriculture is a little bit to the left of the sustainable um, uh, line. And, and so we need to kind of move everybody to the right and, and in a regenerative direction. And we can look at this in particular example of, uh, of soil health in the three scenarios here. Um, one where soil health is degenerating, one where it's been maintained, and one where we're actually improving it. And so we're all about trying to move towards that improvement. And the principles of regenerative agriculture, which have been loosely defined now and also pioneered by a few different um, organisations and communities are, are listed here, which I, I won't go into in any, any great detail, but very much focused around soil and keeping that soil alive and, and being a hotbed for maintaining uh, carbon levels and also fertility and nutrition for, for farming from, but also providing for nature. But I think what's really interesting and most relevant um, is, is how important the integration of livestock is into the system of regenerative agriculture. And yet globally, we have quite a different view of agriculture or society has quite a different view of agriculture and particularly cows, uh, what they're actually doing for the environment. And so this this image sort of captures that quite well, I think. And it's uh, it's it's seen as the norm for or it's generally understood by by many people in society that this is this is the case, and in fact these these grazing herbivores, which have existed for millennia, um, are in fact causing huge amounts of climate change through the emission of methane. But of course, if we think about um, cattle or grazing herbivores in natural ecosystems as part of a, a carbon cycle, um, they are actually a fundamental part of regenerating the land, looking after the soil, keeping those living roots alive and actually circulating carbon, of which methane is a part um, in, in a carbon cycle. And this is an uh, animation from Smiling Tree Farm, which tries to capture this uh, quite well. I'm sure we can share the slides afterwards if you want to um, read this in more detail. But essentially, in particular respect to methane, which is belched from the animal that in time breaks down in the atmosphere and becomes um, uh, carbon and CO2, or CO2 and water rather, and, and that is then reabsorbed by the, the growing plants that the animal then, then feeds on. And so if we think about these animals in this natural system, um, they are circulating carbon and not introducing any new carbon in the form of fossil fuels. But of course, in modern agriculture, it's quite difficult to actually manage these animals in this way without without relying on other forms of fossil fuels but in the wild we can see examples still today uh, thankfully great plains of north america or the serengeti in africa where these animals are still relatively well operating in that natural system within the, the bounds of that carbon cycle so how do we apply those principles to modern farming uh, where we have to kind of earn a living and be be part of a um, fundamental part of our rural economy. And what many advocates around the world are now looking at is how we can use fences to manage where those livestock graze. And so still enable those livestock to move around the landscape, but to control more readily where they go. And so this image is a good example of where that's actually being put into practice. The land on the right is being rested. The animals are grazing there periodically, but being moved on. And that is allowing that that land to um, recover, plants to recover and grow, flower and set seed before the animals return. Conversely, on the left hand side, where the animals are not uh, moved on, there is a slow degradation of the land and the plants that are growing there, such that there becomes more and more bare earth and the plants become unhealthy and, and, and start to die off. And the difference here is, is evident for nature, but also perhaps in terms of temperature. The land on the left is is um, is much much hotter, um, so that has a has a, a local warming effect. The land on the left is less able to cope with droughts, less able to cope with periods of wet weather, and so 
that what we like to desire is what we can actually achieve on the right through through the careful management and planning, uh, which is sometimes uh, referred to as holistic planned grazing. And this can have many benefits um, by allowing the land to rest, to allow these species to flower and set seed above ground, and that provides a, a balanced diet for many of the animals um, that might be grazing on them. And then what's mirrored below ground is actually um, all sorts of different rooting depths as those plants access different uh, vitamins and minerals. And the right hand image here is a cross section of some of the grasses uh, in the Great Plains of North America compared to um, a typical rye grass on the very left where there is a there's a slight um, sort of black smudge which I'm trying to indicate here. Um, so these these uh, native grasses are actually um, considerably taller and bigger and have much larger rooting mass and so if we can encourage that in our farming system that's also very good for soil health and providing much more diversity in our pastures. So how does all this actually uh, apply at the Nepa estate where I'm working? Well what I've highlighted here is um, the estate uh, land ownership boundaries and what we have in the lightly coloured blue areas are the rewilding areas. And I mentioned earlier there are three of those areas uh, which are ring fenced and they're separated um, from each other by roads and highways. And so they've been ring fenced um, where, where they can be, where they practically can be, because we're not able to have free roaming livestock across our roads and, and highways. The other areas which are highlighted in green uh, make up the regenerative farm. So some um, out on the edges, but a, a main block around um, the village of Shipley. And so what we're doing there is we're trying to apply some of these principles of regenerative agriculture and controlled grazing such that we are able to understand what, um, what regenerative agriculture is able to achieve, but also how it can connect to uh, areas of rewilding and how in fact, that may enable us to understand how we can connect to other neighbouring land and create nature corridors across an entire landscape, which is perhaps something even more relevant now as we we face a biodiversity crisis, crisis but where we have hotspots such as in the rewilding areas of, of known rare species. How can we provide those opportunities for them to travel through the landscape and through our neighbouring farmland where there is more of a focus on food production? And I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail later on. We're also wanting the uh, farm here to supply healthy, nutritious food to local people because we're building a new farm shop to cater for the increasing numbers of visitors that are coming to the Nepa State. Uh, I know John mentioned agritourism earlier or tourism in general, but we're very much trying to focus on the agritourism element and how we can actually um, uh, a capitalise on that, but actually engage with that um, audience that are coming to learn and want to know more about how, how we've achieved what we have. So I'm piecing together um, a, a menu out of what we're, we're producing on the land. And essentially we are keeping it all fairly grass based at the moment. That's what this heavy clay soil is best suited to. So we've established a herd of native Sussex cattle, which are very good converters of, um, of our grass into meat. We have established a flock of laying hens. We have a market garden, um, which is just up and running. And we have plans to start a micro dairy in due course. Now, these cattle are managed um, holistically with uh, electric fencing, a simple poly wire. And this is enabling us to achieve that movement of animals around the farm. But more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, enabling that rest period between grazings that will benefit nature so much. And so we can see um, our fencing arrangement here, which is very, very simple. And once the cattle are trained to it, it's actually quite effective. Here's me moving the cattle from one area on the left area to the right, taken with the drone, um, and they sort of sweep around as I let them through into each paddock each day. And as you can see, this sort of creates quite an interesting mosaic of vegetation um, beneath them. And this, this is, is what's helping in the way that we're doing it, helping to create uh, lots of different habitat and varied habitat. We're grazing them in this way um, through as much of the winter as we can as well, given, given the ground conditions. Um, and this is further helping to um, provide grazing and, and different opportunities for different floral species at different times of the year. 
We're also doing bale grazing. So we're pre-placing hay bales from wildflower meadows into those fields, rolling them out during the winter as, as winter feed. All those animals to supplement with what they're they're grazing and browsing in the meantime. So this this process is not only feeding those animals, but also actually helping to introduce uh, new seeds and spread around the seeds um, across different areas of the farm. We are at the moment housing a little bit um, with some old farm buildings just until we've kind of got the grazing system up and running and we're using kind of waste paper, wood chip for that, turning that into compost um, and, and again building windrows out of this, which we're then using to complete the nutrient cycle for our market garden. This was our uh, one hectare market garden uh, a little over 12 months ago. We've been spending all spring working this up into um, uh, uh, a cultivated area, quite intensively cultivated, but trying to keep those principles in mind where we are minimizing soil disturbance. And so the big soil disturbance was, was in that first um, first initial uh, cultivation and we're building um, what we what are called no dig vegetable beds and this is perhaps a slight aside from from what we're talking about on this webinar but I think it's very relevant to think about how what we're doing completes the nutrient cycle and doing it in a way that looks after the soil so these no dig beds are actually um, using the compost from the animal bedding and each year we will keep topping that compost up rather than recultivating it Again, we've done that initial cultivation this year and in future years we keep topping up with, with 25 millimetres or so of this nutrient rich compost and we plant and, and grow directly into that. And thankfully we had our first harvest last week from this small space, um, so we're very excited to start supplying local people with um, fresh organic vegetables. So that's it in terms of what we're producing and growing um, and the way we're trying to do it in a, in a nature friendly way. But a, a common theme I think is, is very relevant as we talk about rewilding or regenerative agriculture or whatever we're doing, it's about being able to evidence and demonstrate that we're making progress. And so right at the beginning of this project, we, we assessed our baselines to understand lots of different parameters um, on a, we're taking a triple bottom line approach, understanding our natural capital and various um, key indicators of, of success or, or non-success across the farm, some of the social aspects, how much opportunity are we creating uh, for people to come and get engaged in the farm? Um, how, what are we doing able to do for people's health through, through the food we're providing, but also access to the green spaces? And how does the economic picture stack up? Does, does this farming business actually make money? How is it contributing to uh, the local economy? So taking an understanding of those as a starting point, and then we're gonna be monitoring progress against a lot of these key indicators over the next few years. So we've been doing lots of soil testing um, to understand what we've got in the soil going on and, and understand what changes are happening. We're looking at things like dung beetles, who we feel are a very key species to help us to um, convert dung into soil and, and keep that soil healthy. And we've been amazed already how much we're seeing the dung beetles travel from the rewilding areas into the regenerative farm. So they are those, those known populations of dung beetles uh, that exist in the rewilding because there's plenty of dung all year round are quickly flying over the scent of some fresh dung, quickly flying over the road uh, and actually traveling quite some distance to find that dung and, and to start processing it. Many small mammals we're seeing increasing already, even after one year of, of starting the project and monitoring things like um, bees, bats, butterflies and moths um, and finding some really interesting different species. And there's a real sense of how much life is in the pasture. This is the morning after um, me moving a calf out of this area into another area. And, and within 24 hours, it's just incredible to see how much, how, mu how many cobwebs are there in that early morning light and, and therefore how many insects are, are being harbored in that pasture. And at least as we graze through that area rather than take in machinery, those, those insects are able to largely stay undisturbed and continue living in that area. So I talked earlier about how we're gonna um, create these nature corridors and how we actually connect to the areas of rewilding. And that's given us a bit of focus around how we're gonna manage um, different areas of the farm, in particular, how we're going to manage our watercourses to enable nature to travel from the rewilded area on the right 
through uh, westwards through the regenerative farm. And so really thinking about those riparian corridors, how can we manage our rivers and our streams and the sides of those areas to help harbour those uh, wild species that want to travel throughout. And also our hedgerows, how they might connect our woodlands together and how we might use them to connect up to our neighbouring farmers. Some of the hedgerows are, are looking pretty poor. These are some pictures from uh, the spring or the winter and some of the areas that have had sheep grazing have had all the bottoms stripped out of those hedgerows and so they're very, very poor for nature at the moment. But our longer term vision is that they become a, a really dense um, structure and dense habitat that, that provide many opportunities for different species to travel within. And, and this sort of cross section is what we're essentially aiming for, where there was a gradient edge on both sides of the, of the pasture, of the hedgerow as the interface with the pasture exists. And so we're really excited about kind of creating that. That's going to involve us using some GPS collars on our livestock that enable us to kind of give really soft edges and create these ecotones on the edges of our hedgerows, but essentially will enable us to move or allow nature to move from one area of strong populations and recolonize other areas of the landscape. So we're really excited to kind of find out how that goes and how we can bring elements of rewilding into the farmed landscape. That's a very, very brief summary, but thank you very much for listening um, and very glad to take any questions later on. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, um, Russ. That was very interesting too. It's kind of um, 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 bringing um, rewilding on a micro scale inside a farm and beside a farm. And a good and an interesting question I can already think of there in, in this day and age when uh, food security because the war in Ukraine is on uh, is very much a hot topic. Have you and all the monitoring, what sort of yields, how does it affect uh, farm yields, this approach we have of integrating uh, rewilding inside the farm? But that could be for the question and answer session later on. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to our third and last speaker, Stanzi. Stanzi Lichens, it's, it's your turn now. Thank you, Anton. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, All right. Can you all see it? Anton, can you see it? Yes, you want to, if, you, if you can get rid of the, oh yeah, you got rid of the toolbar. Good. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, my presentation today will be about wild grasslands and carbon sinks um, and an emerging opportunity to facilitate nature conservation by using uh, the financial tool of carbon finance. Um, I'm an alumni of Lund University. Uh, I studied at the International Institute for Industrial Environmental Economics, um, and my case study was on rewilding Europe. So right now I do work for Euroside, it's not rewilding Europe, but they were my case study. Um, so as you might know, uh, as some of your experts, uh, between 2015 and 2030, more than 20 million um, hectares of abandoned farmland, sorry, will you know be kind of available in Europe and we really obviously that it's so much that we need to work on it uh, but how you know what are some of the private tools instead of subsidies which are also very important can we use to attract funds to work on these um, projects so the main question of my research which happened in 2019 so that's already three years ago uh, was how could projects seeking to enhance the nature-based solution of wild grassland carbon sinks benefit from carbon markets at present? I know there's a lot of technical stuff in here, but I'm gonna detangle it all. Um, so there's a need for a, uh, a business model that financially facilitates the nature-based solution of wild grassland carbon sinks. Um, wild grasslands store much more carbon than artif artificial land use practices, um, such as you know, lands where pesticides are used and there's an intensive presence of cattle um, and where monoculture crops are rooting kind of. So um, how can we really benefit from finance flowing to our rewilding projects, such as the projects that we've heard the past two? Uh, so 
I want to give you a small overview of the two types of markets that there are um, currently. We have compliance markets, which are Kyoto linked. So member states have to uh, kind of stay below a certain cap of pollution. Um, for these carbon offset projects are available in their register. So there is no private projects that can kind of apply to become uh, compliance markets, um, carbon offsets ready to be bought on the compliance market. Um, whereas voluntary markets are more of an independent uh, market based on standards, voluntary participation, uh, there's an unlimited amount of offsets. Um, and the offset price, which is important for my story, is based on negotiation. Um, so just keep that in mind. So the market that I'll be talking about today will be the voluntary market. Um, this is my research in one picture. Um, there is, uh, you know, the carbon market, which I explained, which is a market-based instrument aimed to reduce the carbon overshoot that we have right now. Um, one of the things that reduces this are natural grassland carbon sinks, just as we have peatland grassland peatland sinks, but I'm going to focus on grasslands today. Um, these grasslands that are restored are protected and enhanced by nature conservation organizations. And my whole research was about how um, restoration can be financially facilitated by carbon markets. Um, yeah, so natural grasslands store approximately two to three tons of CO2 per hectare per year. Um, these grassland restoration projects can be turned into carbon offset. Uh, it can be offered to the carbon market. And one carbon credit is equivalent to sequestering or stopping the emission of one ton of CO2 once it has been emitted. So that's a critical point. Um, now, that was just an overview. Uh, the case that I'll be talking about um, that Rewild in Europe presented me is the Coa Valley in Portugal. It's 36,000 hectares of land uh, that has recently come out of agriculture. So this is a really dry uh, part of Portugal um, where mostly farmers have moved away. It's too hot, it's too dry, there's very little precipitation and um, it, it's a really dry and degraded land. And how can rewilding Europe kind of upscale by attracting additional private funds um, for this area. Uh, so this is the whole idea or the pitch. What if the sale of carbon credits could lead to the highly visual and experiential restoration and protection of the European wilderness? I'm now going to explain how, how we could achieve this and how this also could be interesting for other nature conservation uh, organizations. Um, so we, I kind of made a, a calculation by analyzing the current market, there are currently in the Coa Valley 36,000 hectares of grassland uh, at the rate of two and a half tons of CO2 per year. Um, we calculated that 90,000 carbon credits can be uh, kind of offered to the voluntary market. So the whole idea is that you prepare a story being Rebound in Europe or whatever organization that uh, from, from a land, from a wild grass, from a normal grassland that is at zero uh, CO2, no, C, uh, carbon sequestration potential, uh, anything that you do above it will create the carbon credit. So mm -hmm. um, you kind of calculate from a baseline perspective where wild grassland might even, uh, you know, really degraded land might even emit CO2. Um, and then you calculate the amount that you will restore it back to, and that is the tonnage that you offer to the market. Um, so, and then you can establish the price yourself. So, valued credits at the current compliance market price are 24 euros in 2019, so now they're already 34 euros. Um, but of course, if you have a really high and carbon credit, just like you have really good products at a supermarket or less ethical products, you can kind of negotiate um, your own price per ton of CO2. Um, and then using a formula, which I cannot use because of privacy reasons, uh, the carbon credits would raise about 2.1 million per year for the Goa Valley. So uh, that is kind of the whole 
idea in terms of the finance you could attract. Um, the impact of this idea would be that you offer a high quality, transparent and nature-based carbon offset project. Um, and by doing this, you kind of prove economically viable, sustainable land use models um, based on carbon storage and sequestration. And the beauty of that idea too is that now you focus on carbon sequestration, but there's a whole range of other, of course, benefits that, that are delivered by wild grasslands, such as water retention and biodiversity. So just by using this tool of carbon finance, you kind of attract the funds with which you will wild grand, grasslands that um, have a bigger ecosystem function, as you will. Um, and having a growing market for offsetting in wild grasslands uh, might also inspire support of European policy. And that's what I really like about rewilding Europe is that they have these pilot projects that inspire, um, well, maybe the European Commission to do things differently because they show their impact on the ground. Um, so this is the conclusion of my research. Uh, selling land-based carbon credits on the voluntary carbon market provides an important financial mechanism to engineer a switch of land use from a source to a single atmospheric carbon. Um, so yeah, just one more time. Um, the whole idea or the whole thesis in one statement is that attracting investment by the sales of carbon credits through the voluntary market can increase the financial means of nature organizations to undertake projects that directly contribute to the expansion of wild grasslands and our capacity as carbon sinks which leads to visible and experiential European wilderness. Um, I know this is the questions part, but I want to add one more thing. I know there is a lot of criticism on even being able to buy off um, carbon uh, by corporations, but at least if you offer a transparent and, and really uh, proven uh, carbon credit that is also um, you know, certified by the golden standard, which is the, the golden standard for carbon credits in this case, um, there you can really make an impact on the ground. And there are many different carbon projects right now uh, that are, you know, not living up to any standard. There's even examples of um, palm oil plantations in Malaysia, I think, where um, tree planting companies say that these are trees, even though, you know, then after a year, these trees are then cut down again and, you know, sold to the palm oil industry. So there are some really untransparent products on the market as well, but that's the whole, you know, symptom of a free market economy anyways, that you can have, a, you can have an influence on what the quality of your product is and accordingly you can establish your price. So that's, it's, it's a lot about storytelling as well. Um, that's just an idea I wanted to give to you uh, today. So I'm very open to questions as well. So thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Stanzi. That was short and to the point. Excellent. And um, we already have a question that's been waiting a while for um, John Whitelaw, and I'll read it out, John. Uh, you mentioned that the easement holder is an individual does your agreement include possibilities to assign a new easement holder if necessary? In other words, I presume that if the individual in question um, dies or, or goes away or whatever. So. Yeah, the, the short answer is yes. It's, um, it, it just depends on the, um, the, the original contract that, that that sets it up, but um, as long as that contract is worded uh, correctly, uh, there's no no problem with with that at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yes, and then I have see a hand up, Carolina. You, I'll give you the floor. Sorry, no, I just uh, gave my thumbs up to the answer. So it wasn't oh, okay, <laughs> sorry, I, I thought it was a hands up. Okay, but I saw another question that pop up some somewhere. Bill, yeah, Bill. Um, do you want to, um, shall I ask you a question or do you want to ask it yourself, your question? I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to, um, thank you, Anton. Um, and it's, it's I, I guess you'd be expecting this question, Sanzi. Um, how reliable 
do you think the estimate of two to three tonnes of carbon sequestered in in grassland soils, especially when you know it, it, it's so dry mm -hmm. that it, it's had to be abandoned. How how reliable and you know where where does the figure come come from? Um, it, it, it's the reason why I'm firing off with this is because I was talking to some soil scientists this morning, uh, one of whom has spent a lot of time in Switzerland studying the soils there, and he was telling me that you can get massive variations in the amount of organic matter just within a, a meter or two of the same spot. And, and as well, it varies a lot over time. And I, so I, I'm, I'm very dubious about estimates, average estimates of sort of sequestration, but I, I'd be very interested to hear what you say. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, so where I got the data from is I, I comprised a, a, a whole set of basically all the literature I could find on current um, carbon sequestration rates. Uh, so this is a, you know, this is an estimate based on all the projects that are currently there together with new science that's coming in. Um, but you are very right that, you know, even from place to place um, rates differ. And as well, um, these rates are based on optimal carbon sequestration indeed. So. Um, right now, the Coa Valley is nowhere near achieving this rate yet. So that's why the whole world, world restoration uh, is there. So it is more a potential um, number, yet um, this is the cure in science that is available. So I think we have to work with this number and then, you know, learn as we go. And also more techniques are being developed now as we, as we speak about them. So um we just have to work with some sort of benchmark even though i do i do really see what you mean with um question or reliability on this number yet are you working with with scientists to set up a, a monitoring scheme that would allow you to actually verify what what the soil is doing in terms of sucking in carbon that, that would be wonderful. Uh, not right now, but that, that would be a wonderful uh, plan. And also I know in all the literature that I read that that is the, mace, the most like, prominent question is how do we monitor these rates? Um, mm. Also, you know, the, depending on different grass species and shrubs. And uh, so there, there's just so many different variants of uh, rates, you know, with like grazing, yeah. without grazing, with rainfall, without rainfall. So it's, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, a question from Chris, Chris Clark. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, three fascinating presentations. And I've got a question uh, for Russ. Uh, Russ, what measure are you using to calculate the value of the natural capital on your regenerative farm? We're using the uh, UK hub um uh methodology and i've actually got someone else doing it for me so i'm not too hot on all the details um but that's that's my understanding of what the the format we're using so what does the uk hub do uh so it's it's set up a, a procedure for how you value different things so how you value trees or hedgerows or areas of different type of grassland tries to put a measure on it um, but what we're more interested in is, is how that's going to change as a result of our management in, in five years or more. And so there are lots of different uh, methodologies that are available and um, they're, perhaps they should all be standardised, but they're all perhaps relevant to inform us as land managers how we're in making improvements. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a... Um... I would like to come back to my question, Russ, um, that I raised at the end of your presentation, because it does still intrigue me. Um, like I said, your um, micro, um, you're bringing sort of uh, rewilding your farm on a micro scale, bringing um, rewilded elements into your farm. Uh, but between and within those rewilded elements, you've got a, a normal farm, which has to make a, uh, make a living. And um, you, in this monitoring you're doing, uh, what has it yielded so far in terms of what does it say about your productivity of your farm in terms of output per hectare or, or, or similar, you know, after before and after the rewilding? Because um, that's very important, especially in today's 
um, debate about whether we should not get rid of a lot of environmental stuff because we need to boost food production because of the, the worldwide market disruptions? Yeah, that's a really good question, Anton. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the production was 20 years ago before the rewilding started. However, what I do know is that the production and calories per hectare produced were decreasing and it was taking more and more energy to produce that food, more fossil fuels, more cultivations, more chemicals, more fertilizers to prop up that depleting soil. So it wasn't a sustainable farming system anyway. Um, what's happening now across the rewilding areas is that there is food being harvested in the form of, of, of meat. Those grazing herbivores are successfully breeding. They're getting fat in the rewilding because they've got such diverse diets and browsing on lots of different things. And there are 75 tonnes of live weight meat are harvested out of the rewilding areas um, each year. Um, and that's not insignificant. That's quite a substantial amount of, of meat. So it's not entirely um, free from food production. But the way we, we think about it is that the rewilding areas are producing biodiversity first and foremost, and the byproduct is food production in the form of the meat. The, the part of the, the estate that I'm managing, the primary objective is food production, but we're trying to ensure that biodiversity is the byproduct. And so there's this kind of switch around. But what's probably most relevant, I think, in, in answer to that fundamentally is that we need biodiversity as much as we need food and we can't have food without biodiversity and our, and, and our insect populations globally are on the are in many cases on the verge of collapse and so without pollinators we'll struggle to produce so much so much of the food that we do today so we have to look after the biodiversity to provide us with the with the basis for uh, a healthy soil to provide us with food and so what we're trying to do here is, is, is show that there's a, there's a balance to be struck between the two. Areas of land which are very difficult or expensive to farm could well be suited to rewilding, but other areas um, that are better suited to food production could focus on that, but still be linked in a sort of holistic landscape scale approach where they are still connected and providing opportunities for nature. Um, but in simple terms, um, I've got an idea of stocking rates on, on a bit of land I'm managing, and it was much lower than, than what it is now by just by the very fact of, of moving the animals around and providing the rest periods. Sometimes we call it sort of mob grazing, or holistic plant grazing, and that recovery period between the grazings and is enabling us to actually grow more forage, grow more grass. So we are over time, and it's a bit early for me to say, but we are increasing our stocking density on that area of land. So in, in some ways you can say that we're increasing our productivity and also benefiting nature. So it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, Martin, your hand is up. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, when we are talking about food and uh, in context of war, uh, I think that uh, we uh, should remember that 30% uh, of uh, food production uh, goes to the rubbish. And I think that the problem is not produ production, but uh, a fair dis distribution of this food. Mm, so uh, I think that the most important in a production context is to make the soil uh, health, uh, to uh, fight with uh, climate change. But uh, when we are talking about uh, food production, uh, mm, first of all, uh, I think that it is about law. The second and the next is that the organic farms, uh, regenerative farms, uh, can have uh, the same uh, amount of production uh, or uh, more uh, than uh, conventional farm. Uh, everything de depends on this soil in this 
a conventional farm, uh, the quality of the soil goes down, like Ras uh, show us on this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, in organic uh, farms, uh, this soil have more and more potential to the to production. So I think that uh, this is only uh, there is only one way um, to fix our uh, farming. Thank you, everyone, for presentations. Okay, um, I have a question for for, for John. Um, here's a, a, the um, Russ was presenting um, quite eloquently how uh, cattle and, other, and herbivores in general, large herbivores, how they uh, cycle nutrients and how they cycle carbon dioxide and, and, and methane through the system and that it's an equilibrium system and in, in, at least in a natural ecosystem, whether it's the uh, Serengeti Plains or the uh, uh, the North American prairies and, um, he and how he and, and his farm is, is in a sense trying to achieve that same kind of equilibrium. Now, in your case, John, uh, you actually, for you, the cattle were pretty much the enemy. I mean, you got rid of them right from the start and you certainly don't want them back. So I was wondering, how do you feel about that? Or would you argue, or how do you, or less for this, since cattle are not exotic to Latin America, where do would you say the llamas or alpacas, you know, the indigenous herbivores, would they play a similar role? I mean, could they be useful in your situation? How do you see all this issue about herbivores and and, and their role in, in, in the ecosystem? That's yeah, it's a it's a good question, Anton. And um, here I've become schizophrenic. My my family are farmers. Um, we are in in Australia. We're following um, a very similar pattern to. The one uh, Russ uh, outlined, um, we call it the Serengeti model of, of, of grazing, the um, in, intense grazing. So, um, yeah, I, I, cows are not necessarily the enemy, but in our context, they are. And, and let me let me explain why. The situation Russ is ex explaining has evolved over centuries. You know the. The insect life, the, the dung beetles, and 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 the um, uh, the there, there is um, a memory, an ecosystem memory there that that can be drawn on. Cows came into this region where we are. Probably, let me think now. No more than eighty years ago. Now, in, in terms of, of ecosystem development and stability and evolution, that's, that's yesterday. The, the dung beetles don't exist. The, the, um, uh, the, the, the soil isn't, isn't adapted to, to hard hoof, hooved animals. Now, okay, so that takes us on to another herbivore, yamas and alpacas and wakunyas and wanakos. The fact is that they're not endemic to the region either. Oh. So, so um, you know, this, this the, the cow and the sheep and the goat in, in our region is, is a complete foreigner. You know, it, it, Traditionally, it had no place in the in the um, uh, in the ecosystem. So um, uh, the the other point I make is that that the the culture of of and I put culture in inverted commas of of our region is what I'd call the gaucho culture. It's extensive grazing. You know, you you let the the cows roam free and then. Once a year, you go out and find out how many you've still got and how many are dead, and and that's it. What Russ is describing is is management of 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 the animals, so you know working with the animals, and that that is a, a totally different sort of relationship with with the animal. Um, cows, in in Russ's situation, intensive grazing, cows have to eat everything, you know. In our situation, cows, cows aren't stupid. They, they eat the soft stuff and not the woody stuff. And so in no time at all, 
you've got you've got uh, an area which is overrun with with woody shrubs and all the succulents have disappeared so yeah different situation mm -hmm. I, t I like cows but not in our place and um, just to add to that anton a very good point john makes there and I, th I think having worked with lots of farmers across the uk it, it often comes down to how those animals are actually managed whether they bring benefit or or uh, or not and stocking rates is is a key indicator of that hmm. yeah. i see in the background there's been that this uh, quite a, a debate going on um so, uh, about the role of uh, of cattle in general uh, and ecologically speaking um sylvie i mean would you like to say say something about it openly uh, uh on screen about your point about uh, about the whole relevance of 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 of, of cattle in in, uh, in in nature um, nature 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 friendly farming. Oh. Sure. Sorry, yeah. I, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> mm. But well, um, I was wondering, like, yes, uh, I already got a response from um from bill on this uh, that there is enough evidence to show that methane is actually also um absorbed by bacteria let's say um but i still think there's a lot of focus on this grazing nowadays whereas there are other methods i mean the grazing for food production um, that's what i think is way too much focus on i mean we would not be able to feed the world or the world population with that little bit of grazing that is possible on the land because we have yeah there's not enough land for everyone to, to eat meat in that sense so i always wonder um, wouldn't there be also the same effect if you let wild herbivores or other um, kind of wild animals come back in um, to the areas and do the carbon sequestration that way because in the end they're doing the same and we could use that other land also to successfully uh, produce enough vegetable fruits whatever we eat but anyway i mean it's more a comment this is not so much a question I'm, I'm very aware of the the science that is going on and there's also the the counter science let's say that debates that argument that was brought up by um, bill so that it's not a balance basically so i think it always depends on what you put more weight on or how you ask the, the research question mm -hmm. yeah but i think your your basic uh, what i uh, remark i saw in one of your comments in the chat is that uh, why not skip uh, the cow middle per middle person and uh, directly grow vegetables convert those into food and uh, and then if where we do need to uh, have grazing let let, uh, let na natural uh, grazes uh, do that work in other words you're questioning the whole point of having having a a grazing part of agriculture because you're, because we can do without it in terms of food production that's that seems to that is your your central point is it not well indeed at, at least not this main focus it seems like it's presented now as the silver bullet like this um carbon sequestration through cattle farming or whatever other animal farming it's like the silver bullet. I mean, it's a marginal, a, a tiny uh, drop there in the bucket, let, let's say. And there's also enough evidence to debunk the whole um, science behind Ellen Savory's uh, Serengeti uh, carbon sequestration. And so I'm just not convinced, let's say, by the arguments. Um, and I think there should be more focus on alternatives. There are certainly a few grazing models. I mean, we won't get rid of all the cattle overnight let's say and there certainly needs to be much more focus first to also get rid of all the mass animal production or all the um um yeah the the huge large scale cattle feeding operation systems and so on so but still i, th I think we cannot just convert everything into grazing landscapes or like put all the cattle that is produced now for meat production outside and, and put them outside grazing. That's just such a, a small amount of food production where there's much more food that would come from other sources. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to just respond to that. And Sylvie raises a very good point. And 
if anybody's read um, George Monbiot's new book, Regenesis, which which you know articulates some of these arguments quite well. Um, and I think from from my perspective, and 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 this isn't perhaps the the right place to get into debate about what we should be eating as humans, but diet and our dietary choices, as I, as I mentioned in, in my talk, is is very relevant to how land is managed. But I would say, from my perspective, I've seen just how valuable it is to have those animals being a part of our ecosystem because of what what biodiversity they help to um, harbour and 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 enable, particularly uh, a lot of insects that are so reliant on those animals. Now. We don't have to eat those animals, but I think they should be in our landscape. And what would be even better for nature is if those animals were allowed to die in our landscape and, and provide um, rotting flesh for a whole host of other the, other uh, invertebrates and, and other species that are currently kind of missing from from our, our our recreated, rewilded systems. But that isn't the case, and we've got people to feed. And, and as you said, there's a need for a transition from where we are today to to um, more nature friendly solutions, and in, in in the USA, for example, I've worked quite closely with the American Grass Fed Association, and in the USA, only three percent of cattle in the USA are one hundred percent grass fed. So ninety seven percent of those animals are being uh, are being fed grains, um, which we're increasingly seeing is is not necessarily. The right way to to manage animals in tune with nature. So there's still a very very long way to go. And, and if we just could, could get farmers and consumers encouraging farming systems that are more in tune with nature, that it takes us on that path towards a more sustainable and more regenerative future, in, in my opinion. Uh, and I, I know there are claims about Alan Savory's uh, work and how true it actually is, but it's not just about the carbon, it's about the other benefits. And I see that every day. I see, I see how much life those cattle actually bring to our land. Anton, if I could just follow up on um, uh, something I should have mentioned, and it's got nothing to do with food production, but it has got something to do with grazing animals. One of the, the, the native uh, animals that, that is coming back into um, our, our territory, our property, is uh, the Wamulas. This is a, um, a deer, um, a native deer that um, is very, very timid. Um, and with the removal of the cattle and removal of dogs and not having people in, in the area, we're seeing that coming in. And so in the higher areas, we, we've got grazing, native native grazing that um, is, is really good to see. Mm, that's good news. Excellent. Mm. That's good news. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we're nearing the end. Um, so if any, well, I, I need, I'll, you'll, I'll take your question, but before we sign off, um, I see, because people are already starting to leave because um, it's getting to be close to time, and this um, the session has been recorded, and we will make the uh, recording available. So if you'd like to be uh, do to see the recording, or you want to have a, 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 any other information, please uh, send an email. Um, Caroline or Stanzi, could you uh, in the chat put in uh, put up my email address? I mean, I will use my email as, as being the central point. Uh, you could also, uh, um, and so if anybody would like to be kept in touch or to get to know where the recording can be seen once it's ready, send me an email, and um, and I also um, and um, and we can also keep you informed about future webinars. Um, Anik, down, uh, your question. It's not really a question, if I may. I just wanted to make quick um, comments. I was really impressed by all the presentations. And, and on the last debate on cows, I just wanted to say I spent the holiday in southern Germany where cows are in stalls because, um, like John, you were, you were saying, they cannot go outside because they're, what do you say, the feet are, are disturbing the land. So they're kept. In, inside and they are then and the grass the, the, the grass is cut and, and they're fed and on the and the, and what I did last year was going to an area in it's actually a nature reserve and that would maybe interest you Russ where um, um, uh, old cattle varieties I don't know if you say that uh, were reintroduced in the in uh, because the dung beetle is the is a very important feed for the only bad 
nursery that exists in the area. So they're introducing cows in a nature reserve. Yeah, just just to see. I mean, the complexity. I think of 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 what it uh, it all um, encompasses uh, with cow. And then I just wanted to say to John very quickly. Um, you said that you were amazed by um, um, all the plants that were coming out of the soil again. Now I worked in in the pesticide industry for many years and um, the, my herbicide colleagues who did testing for years and years and decades, we were always amazed that in the control testing, what, what came out in terms of weed, they don't disappear like that. They're there, there's a lot of, there's a bunker there. <laughs> I'm not saying that, you know, you should use herbicide everywhere and at all times, but there is a lot of resource there that maybe you can even tap on. And um, Ras, on, on your point of definition of regeneration, uh, regenerative agriculture, I, I was going to ask you, what is your definition? I missed one thing, which is key for the term sustainable. And we use the word sustainable today instead of sustainable development, as it was coined by the Club of Rome. The development part is often taken away just for semantics, it's easier. So it is, a, it's a development state. I mean, it's a development. Sustainable is not something fixed. What I missed on your, on your slide is resilience because sustainable development has been one thing, but what we are now facing with climate change is shocks and the uh, ability to, to recover. So the regenerative or whatever you want to call it, we call it uh, always integrated crop management, is really the tool to combine sustainable development and resilience management in the farm. That's how I would, I, I'm, I'm always intrigued because the development part is, um, is taken away of, of uh, yeah. The, the the important word sustainable. Okay, that's it. I'll stop here. Thank you so much for all your your presentations. Really inspiring. Okay, thanks, Anik. Um, anybody else? Any more? I don't see any more questions. Um, maybe to finish off, um, because we uh, it's very um, uh, just one uh, question. I would like to put to Stanzi. Um. So people still, and meanwhile, anybody who would like to be uh, to, uh, get a link to the recording or to have it, uh, just send your name, uh, put up your name in the chat or send me an email afterwards. My email is, is up there in the chat, Anton Geisenbeek at skynet.be. Um, Stancy question I had, I mean, it reminds me of a conversation with an Australian um, carbon farming uh, scientist uh, Richard Eckhart, and he was saying Australia, which is a very much a dry, dry land ecosystem, much like your Coa Valley with thin soils. Uh, what they'd notice is that um, soil carbon is very, very dependent on, on, on rainfall and it fluctuates. In other words, if you have a couple of good years with normal, well, for Australian terms, normal rainfall, you get carbon, a reasonable level of carbon in the soil, and then you get a drought. And the soil level in the in the in the in the, in the, in the soil, the carbon level drops automatically and drastically, and it takes a couple of years to recover again, even if the rain comes. So the question then is: If you start selling carbon credits as a farmer in in a dry land condition like Portugal, Australia, and you're selling it at a moment when the uh, the measurement of your carbon content is quite high because it's been relatively moist, and then and then a couple of years later you get a drought, your carbon level goes down. And, and that's Richard Eckhart's question, and that's why uh, that's why he's very critical of the Australian system of carbon credits. What happens then? Does the farmer have to pay back some of his credits because this, the carbons are no longer there? Um, how do you deal with this issue of, of highly fluctuating levels, uh, which are typical apparently for dry dry soil conditions? Right, that's a very good question. Thanks, Anton. Um... I know I'm not an, a soil expert. I was just looking at the financial, you know, tool. Yet I do know that right now, um, in all carbon projects, um, the mean estimate is used based on the science currently available. So until monitoring systems are put in place, everything is based on an estimate, um, and everything is based on an average. So um, there is no monitoring unless uh, a project initiator establishes such a monitoring system himself or herself. Um, 
So for now, it's it's all based on estimations. And I do get that that's a very volatile thing to do, but there is simply no other way to deal with it right now. Um, but I know that, yeah, just like the price of carbon is set at a standard, it's the same with the carbon sequestration rate. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay, good. Thanks. Now I think we really will close. Um, we're, we're over time. And um, well, thanks again, everybody, um, for joining this um, webinar. And, um, you know, once we got this the debate got going, it's a pity we weren't actually in the same room having a, a drink together, because that really would have been could have become a very lively and good discussion. Also, in view of what was going on in the background on the chat. Um, but um, hopefully in the future, we'll do as ABC uh, group, um, we will do more um, on-site meetings and, uh, and workshops and less perhaps uh, online webinars. That's something to think about. And so again, thank you all for joining. And uh, um, Russ, John, Stanzi, thank you very much for your presentations. Really interesting. And uh, I'm certainly going to uh, have a, a, a listen and look at the um, recordings because there's a number of things that intrigued me, which I didn't quite catch first time around. So um, again, ever wishing everybody all the best and a great summer in, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and uh, all the best and good health to everybody and hope to see you again at our next webinars and we will start again at, at the end of August. And so bye for now. Yeah. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye. bye.